Hello and welcome back! In the last episode about Attack of the Petsky Robots, I showed you the game I designed for the Commodore Pet, and then later ported to the Commodore 64 and added color. I also made a VIC-20 version and showed you that as well. At the end of the last episode, this was the level of completion the game was in at the time. So where are we at now? Well, the game engine is now 100% complete, other than for any bug fixes that might turn up. The sound and music is about 87% complete, and the level design is also now 100% complete. So um, now I want to show you what the status is of all three versions of the game, and I'll start with the pet version. There's not a huge amount to show here as it was pretty close to complete last time I showed it to you. Obviously there have been a variety of small improvements made to the graphics. I've done most of my testing on the mini pet, which uh, has been a permanent fixture on my desk for the last many months. But the main work has been on completing the different robots. I'd already shown you the hoverbots. Uh, these robots are generally docile and they're kind of all over the place. And they're pretty easy to kill in most cases. And I had already shown you Evilbot, which is the most powerful robot in the game, and he's very hard to kill, and uh, he's kind of like the level boss. But the game needed another robot that's sort of an in-between, so here's Rollerbot. He rolls around and attacks you by shooting at you uh, whenever you line up with him on the X or Y axis. So he's stronger than the Hoverbot, but uh, he's kind of like the middleman, and you'll typically find like, two or three of these on every map. Also, I managed to include a few neat special effects on the pet version, such as when you use the EMP, the screen flashes, and where there's a large explosion, the screen shakes. Since the pet has no global screen registers to do these sort of effects, it was challenging to write assembly routines fast enough to pull this off. The pet version still doesn't have working sound, but we're close to getting that to work. Of course, I want to show you how all of the weapons and items work, but we'll get to that when I show you the C64 version, because that's the one you're probably going to like the most. Oh, and I also fixed the flickering sprites. Uh, in the last video I said I was going to do this by mixing the sprites in the background off screen and then copying it to video RAM afterwards. However, after thinking about it more, I ended up taking a different approach. Instead, before each screen draw, I pre-calculate the position of every sprite on the screen and then place it in a lookup table. And then, as the playfield is being drawn out, it checks against that lookup table to see if it needs to draw a sprite in that spot. Now, this actually worked out even better since it uses uh, less RAM and less CPU time than a full double buffer. The game now has nine maps, and I'll show you a bit more of those later as well, but I also want to show you that the keyboard controls are now configurable. You can use the standard map, which I think is best suited to the game and well documented in the user manual, or you can just use a custom key layout, and um, here you can just press whichever key you want to use for each function, so you can use whatever works best for you. And last but not least, the SNES controller option is now fully functional. And uh, here I have a prototype of the user port adapter, and this has been tested in the PET, VIC-20, and C64, and it works with all versions. It's actually quite a sight to see a PET being played with a Super Nintendo controller. And not only does it work, but it works really well. Um, I plan to include one of these adapters in every boxed copy of the game. Getting the game to work on the pet first did have one major advantage. Now, one thing I've often complained about with the 16-bit era of gaming, such as with the Amiga, is that these systems had such amazing graphics and sound for the time that a lot of the game developers concentrated all of their effort on impressing us with uh, fancy graphics and sound. And don't get me wrong, we loved it at the time. I, mean, I used to start up games like Blood Money on my Amiga 500 just to listen to the music and watch the intro, but ultimately I found the gameplay actually really boring. Shadow of the Beast is another example where the graphics were absolutely stunning at the time. I mean, you almost have to have lived during this time to understand how shockingly good these graphics look compared to what we were used to. However, today these graphics seem almost primitive as such, Many of these games have not withstood the test of time, because if the graphics and sound don't impress people, then all you have left is the gameplay. And if the gameplay isn't any good, then the whole game isn't any good. Of course, don't get me wrong, there were definitely some Amiga games that I still enjoy playing today, like Populous, and of course, let's not forget Lemmings. Well, since I designed this game to work first and foremost on the pet, a machine with arguably very limited graphics capabilities, gameplay was a top priority, and uh, I've spent hundreds of hours playing this game myself as I test, and I continue to find it to be fun, so I think I came up with a good formula, which means the C64 versions will be even that much better. So speaking of the C64 version, uh, when I last showed off the game, it was still looking like this. Uh, it was using Petsky characters only, but looks significantly better than the pet version since it did at least have color. However, I had promised to make a version of the game with enhanced graphics and sound, and well, here we go. Thank <laughs> you. 
As you can see, things look and sound quite a bit different, uh, but the gameplay is 100% identical to the original PET version. It plays from the exact same map files. And of course, the C64 version can also use the user port adapter to play with a Super Nintendo controller. So let's talk about some of the development challenges. Um, as mentioned before, every tile is based on nine characters. And even though I can redefine those characters, there are limits to what I can do. One immediate problem I needed to solve was that the default character set is split in half, with the second half a reversed copy of the first half. However, since my menu was using these reversed characters along with the in-game cursor that allowed you to select things, if I wanted to free up that second half of the character set, I'd need to find another way. So, you can see that I'm using a flashing animation for the menu text now, and for the cursor used in the game, I am instead using a sprite for that. Speaking of sprites, uh, the item and weapons displays are now sprites as well. I used two sprites next to each other for a total of four sprites. Uh, this allowed me to have a little more detail in these items. Now, I still had three sprites left though, so I used those for the player character. In order to get the most detail possible, I'm using three high-res sprites layered on top of each other so that I can have three colors for my player character. However, designing the custom characters was still a big challenge. For example, take a look at these chairs that were submitted to me for artwork. Well, they look really nice, and uh, these totally conform to the nine character limitations, but I ended up sticking with chairs that look similar to the Petsky chairs. But why, you might ask? <laughs> well, I have 256 tiles in the game, and if you wanted nine custom characters for every tile, uh, which would be ideal, uh, you'd need 2,304 characters. <laughs> but as you know, we only have 256 characters, so uh, that means we need to figure out a way to make characters reusable between tiles. So the nice looking chairs have 14 unique characters shared between these five tiles, and only two of those characters are reusable in other tiles on the map that aren't chairs. My chairs, on the other hand, use only nine unique characters, and eight of those nine characters are actually reused in other tiles on the map. And so this was the type of dilemma I was constantly faced with. Now, I ran into a similar problem with these robot concepts that were sent to me. I mean, they look really great. Um, again, every one of these is technically doable, but they use nine unique characters per tile, and the robots also animate, so that means a single robot would consume potentially 36 characters. And with three types of robots, that's over 100 characters just for these three types of robots. So again, that just wouldn't be possible. I also redesigned the C64 version of the tile editor so that it could edit tiles for the VIC-20, Color Petsky, and the C64 graphics modes. When selecting graphics, it loads in the custom font, and the character screen selection looks a lot different. Now, admittedly, it's kind of a jumbled mess because I created characters all over the place, not knowing exactly how things would turn out. But yeah, the idea is I can select a character, and then I can edit the character right there in the tile editor. And while I did receive numerous submissions for artwork, uh, ultimately the vast majority of it was done by me. It was really just too difficult for most of the artists that offered to help uh, due to the limitations imposed not just by the hardware but by the game engine too. Uh, basically it required somebody to be able to look at the game as a whole in order to design any graphics rather than just concentrating on single tiles. Um, however, Andrew Miller designed the player sprites and a few people submitted ideas for weapons and item sprites, but I ended up altering them quite a bit. And of course I'm not an experienced pixel artist so I suspect somebody else might be able to improve upon what I've done here, but I think it's good enough. For the C64 version of the game, I once again hired Noelle to do the composition after the amazing work she did on Planet X3. And we saw no reason to reinvent the wheel on the C64, so we decided to go with Goat Tracker for the music and sound effects, uh, which is a composition tool that works on modern computers and will export to real C64 files. Working on Petsky Robots was by far one of the most unique challenges I've had as a composer. While I'm used to working with old sound chips and have been working with them for years, the limitations of the SID chip were a bit unique compared to what I was used to. Since it's only a free voice sound chip and we needed at least one of those for sound effects, I had two choices here. Either I could make a soundtrack that uses all free voices, but one of them cuts off regularly for sound effects, or I could just make a two voice soundtrack. And I chose the latter because even though it was way more difficult, it sounded significantly better to me. 
Composing for two voices requires a completely different mindset than, say, making music with a DAW and some keyboards. Every single note has to count, and you can't pet out the sound with fancy synth sounds or something to make the track sound richer than it really is. Both channels are pulling way over their weight at any given time, sometimes switching between four different instruments simultaneously, and while this isn't abnormal for chip music, the specific limitations of working with only two channels makes this way harder than normal. Another pressing issue is the lack of volume control. The SID chip doesn't let you change volume on a per voice basis, so the only way to really balance sound is to kind of fake it by giving instruments a really long attack phase and never letting them hit their peak. It's rough, and the difference between two values on the attack envelope can be the difference between blowing your ears out at the start or being just a quiet whisper, but it worked well enough to let me balance the sound effects. Then there was the question of what kind of music I was even going to make. I didn't want something super fast-paced since, well, this isn't a fast-paced game, but it's not exactly a slow-paced one either, so I went for something kind of in the middle that I felt struck a good balance, as well as tunes that had a lot of variety in them so you didn't get tired of hearing the same segment and idea over and over again in a three-minute time span. Overall, despite the challenges, I am really happy with my work on the game, and I hope everyone can enjoy it and appreciate the work that went into making a soundtrack with such a limited set of tools. Oh, and of course I can't forget to talk about the VIC-20 version. Uh, remember the last time I said the VIC-20 version would be just regular Petsky? Well, <laughs> I eventually figured out a way to cram in the enhanced graphics from the C64 version, so the VIC-20 version now looks like this. Of course, I have no hardware sprites to use on the VIC-20, so I dedicated a few custom characters to help make the player characters, weapons, and items look a little nicer, as you can see. Uh, you may notice the player character is monochrome. It's basically the same bitmap as used on the sprites on the C64 version, but I converted them to monochrome so they could be displayed as character graphics, and I think it works pretty well. Also, as you can probably hear, uh, sound is working on the VIC-20 version too. Um, however, the sound routines have been coded by Alex Semenov, who also coded the sound routines for Planet X3. Uh, he's also working on a similar sound routine for the pet. Now, this game totally maxes out the VIC-20's RAM and does require a 35k RAM expander option, which bumps the computer up to around 40k of RAM. In my testing, I've been using a penultimate cartridge, but uh, other RAM expanders should work too. Um, unfortunately, I did have to leave a few things out on the VIC-20 version due to RAM limitations. Uh, they're all minor things that don't affect the gameplay. Uh, for example, on the C64 version, when you go into the cinema, uh, there's a scrolling message with several jokes. But uh, on the VIC-20 version, it just says VIC-20 on the screen. Also, the in-game screen is missing a few things. Um, on the C64 version, it tells you how long the game lasted, uh, but the VIC-20 version doesn't. And the VIC-20 doesn't have redefinable keys, but it does have two different key set options, and of course, the SNES controller. So yeah, there are a few other features like this missing from the VIC-20 version, but nothing that's going to change how the game actually plays. I'm actually really happy with how the game has turned out, and I hope it'll be considered one of the best VIC-20 games of all time. So let's talk a bit about the gameplay itself. Uh, this game was inspired by several of my favorite games. Uh, obviously the top down view is straight from Ultima 6. And I had been calling this isometric projection. However, several arguments erupted as to whether that was the correct term. And it turns out this type of projection is called oblique, or more specifically, cavalier. But uh, more than just the appearance, the way in which the player can push objects around is also copied from Ultima. Um, as is the need to search objects to look for weapons. And of course, <laughs> the powder kegs. Um, and if there were multiple close together, they would chain react. Uh, this is what the chemical canisters in Petsky Robots are modeled after. Uh, now the other game that had significant influence was Duke Nukem 3D. I mean, I suppose any first person shooter could be given as an example, but uh, Duke 3D is the one I've spent the most time playing. The way in which the medkit works is inspired by Duke 3D, and it even says, ah, much better, <laughs> which is what Duke says when he uses the bathroom. Oh, and don't forget the three colored key cards needed to open various doors, which uh, found its way into the new game. And of course the Hoverbot is inspired by Vincent from the movie The Black Hole, and Evilbot was <laughs> likewise inspired by Maximilian. Oh, and of course there's the Trash Compactor, uh, and in this example I've tricked an entire army of some of the most powerful robots to just line up and walk into the Trash Compactor. And you may notice that every time this happens it says, Door Terminated, down in the info screen, which is of course a nod to the Terminator movies, especially Terminator 1, where Sarah Connor crushes the Terminator in a hydraulic press. 
But there's uh, also another connection to my game because Terminators apparently operate on 6502 assembly language, as can clearly be seen in the movie. And this game is, of course, written in 6502 assembly. So there's an analogy I once heard about beta testing that I think really applies here, and it goes something like this. So a group of engineers design a robot to be a bartender, and they program this bartender to handle any kind of drink combination imaginable, and they even program it to handle illogical requests, like if somebody were to come in and order uh, zero drinks or order negative five drinks, and it can handle all of that. So they think it's ready, they put it out for um, to go to work, and then the first customer that walks in asks, Where's the bathroom? <laughs> and of course the robot's head explodes because that's just something that the engineers just never planned for. And that's very much been my experience with uh, game coding because I'm sort of, I have like an internal bias because when I'm playing the game and testing it, I know how the game is supposed to work. So there are just certain things that simply don't occur to me to even try. <laughs> And so, much like my previous games, I had somebody come over and I watched them as they played the game. Uh, this time it was my daughter's boyfriend, and he immediately found like four or five bugs within the first few minutes. <laughs> He's played a lot of video games, but I think he found playing on the keyboard very awkward, so in later testing I think he was relieved when uh, I got the Super Nintendo controller working. And so one problem that every beta tester complained about was that it was too hard to search objects. In the original game, you had to search a very specific tile to find the hidden item. So if the object was something large like this desk, uh, you might have to search it four or five times in different spots to find the hidden item, if there was one there at all. So that was one problem, um, so I solved that by an overhaul of the search system. Uh, now it's possible to walk up and search any object by simply selecting any piece of it. Now this saves a lot of time. Um, the next thing I did was to simply make a lot of objects unsearchable. Uh, for example, things like plants, chairs, and trees, and whatnot, simply do not allow a search to take place, thus limiting the types of objects that need to be bothered with searching. And the last thing I did to help out the situation was to show crates with their top open after a search. Um, and once the top is off, it will not allow you to search it again. And since probably 80% of the game's hidden items are in crates, uh, this saves a lot of time by uh, preventing you from wasting time searching the same crate twice. In fact, uh, <laughs> some of you are going to hate me because there will be a whole room full of crates, and uh, you'll even have to move them around just to get access to them for searching. But again, at least now, uh, you can clearly see which ones have been searched. Of course, there is one problem that I encounter that's not really a bug as such, but it actually has to do with our modern progressive scan televisions. You see, when a large explosion goes off, it shakes the screen at 60 hertz, which I think looked great. Uh, I wasn't trying to create an earthquake look uh, as much as I was trying to show more of a vibration. Well, uh, when I captured video directly from a C64 or emulator, uh, it would capture at 30 frames per second in progressive scan, and as such, often the vibrations simply didn't show up at all. And since I wanted this to be more visible, not only for my videos, but when uh, other YouTubers eventually review the game, I wanted the vibration to be visible, so I had to slow it down some. And of course, I needed to get more people to test the SNES adapter on various machines. Now, we didn't have any SNES connectors at the time, so I just hardwired five controllers uh, directly to the boards and zip tied them like this. Then I mailed these out to five beta testers. Unfortunately, I never heard back from three of them, but uh, the two I did hear back from said it worked on several systems, so I think we're good. I made a pretty bold claim in the original video that the game would be supported on all of these platforms, and in theory it should be possible. But the amount of work turned out to be just too much, especially considering the smaller audience of some of these more rare computers, and the color pet version uh, turned out to be impossible. Uh, the final game maxes out the pet's 32k RAM limitation, uh, which means there's no RAM left to handle the color. And so um, I decided just for now to concentrate on the pet, C64, and VIC-20. Uh, not to say I won't release other ports in the future, but at least for the initial rollout of the game, uh, these will be the only computers supported. On the bright side, I can confirm that the game does work on 80 column pets, uh, but it does require running a little program first that puts the pet into a simulated 40 column mode, so everything's sort of squished in the center of the screen, but hey, at least it works. I also wanted to show you this neat graphic. Uh, I managed to capture the same screen on all four versions, which is pretty cool because you can see the progression of the graphics from the pet uh, to the color version on the C64, and then followed by the final enhanced version. And then of course the VIC-20 version. 
And so, uh, just to be clear, there are four versions of this game, but uh, that's because there are two versions for the C64. I had thought about abandoning the Petsky version once I saw how good the graphics version was turning out to be, but um, I thought I should keep it because it's kind of interesting to be able to see what sorts of things are possible with just Petsky graphics. But uh, this is also the only version that contains the pet mode, which I wanted C64 users to be able to play with. I will make one bold claim. I can confidently say that this is the best game ever designed for the Commodore PET. Now, to be fair, <laughs> there aren't exactly a lot of PET games out there. It was never a particularly popular system to write games on, and most of the games that are out there are you know, hobbyist games designed to run on 8 or 16K. But I think that uh, once the game starts to get out there in the hands of other PET users, I hope that they will validate that claim, and perhaps, just perhaps, uh, it will motivate somebody else to actually try to make an even better game for the PET. As for the VIC-20 version, it may not be the best game ever made for the VIC-20, but I think I can confidently say it has to be at least in the top five best games ever. Um, again, we're talking about a platform with just a few hundred games, and most were designed to fit in an 8 or 16K ROM cartridge, and this is just one of a handful of games that makes use of a fully expanded VIC-20. And for the C64 version, well, uh, the C64 has thousands of games, and at least a hundred really, really good games. So there's a lot more competition here, but I hope it makes it into at least the top 20 games. Um, I guess time will tell. My only regret is not having a nice bitmapped intro screen graphic, but I left this out on purpose because it wouldn't fit into RAM, and I didn't want the player to have to wait for it to load from disk every time they restart the game after dying. Um, however, I'm investigating the possibility of a cartridge version of the game, in which case I would give it a better intro screen. So at the moment we are finalizing the details on the box and the manuals, and uh, I'll throw some pictures up of what these look like at the moment. Uh, these are almost done, and I hope to send these off to production in about a week. And so I'm thinking the first box copies could actually go on sale and be shipped out probably sometime in late January. So a lot of people have asked if I'm going to do a Kickstarter, and the answer is no. Uh, the last time I did a Kickstarter, it nearly killed me. So what my plan is, uh, when the game is complete, it's, I'm just going to discreetly put it up for sale on my website and let the, um, <laughs> let the sales start to trickle in a little bit so that I can fill the sales as they come in. And, um, of course, if you want to be one of the first people to get a hold of the game, then I recommend joining the official Attack of the Pesky Robots Facebook group. And I'll put a link down in the description because I'm most likely going to post, uh, you know, an update there that, hey, the, the game's available for sale. And this should be the final episode of Attack of the Petsky Robots. I might possibly do a follow-up later talking about the physical production of the game and maybe doing a walkthrough and explaining a little bit more of the gameplay itself. But, uh, but yeah, that's it for the moment. So, um, as always, thanks for watching. <laughs>